Hi everyone, you've reached Lecture 5, Sex, Gender, and the Media's Male Gaze, to be completed by Wednesday, June 22nd. There's hardly a day that goes by in America's current media landscape where issues of gender representation are not thrust into the national spotlight. A mere sampling of major news stories from the last few days underscores the degree to which gender occupies a pivotal role in our social, political, and intellectual collective conscious. Now, on Wednesday, GQ magazine unveiled the cover for its July issue, which featured Kim Kardashian West completely nude, except for a leather jacket strategically clutched, uh, clutched to her body, as you can see there. This led New York Magazine to investigate the recent history of GQ cover models wearing leather jackets with nothing else underneath, and contrasting them with the ways in which male models were permitted to wear such leather jackets, obviously in a very different manner. Um, here's another news story. On Friday, uh, the e at the E3 Electronic Entertainment Expo, the educational group Feminist Frequency unveiled its gender breakdown of new video games showcased at the conference. And of the 59 games profiled, only two, ReCore and Horizon Zero Dawn, featured exclusively female protagonists. On the other hand, 24 games featured only male protagonists. And on sa Saturday, the hashtag uh, No Woman Ever a movement calling attention to the issue of women subjected to misogynistic street harassment by men, reached over 100,000 mentions on Twitter. Users employed the hashtag to expose how pervasive and invasive misogyny is to women's everyday lives. Now, with such widespread attention routinely devoted by social media uh, to issues of activism and women's rights, one might wonder whether why gender inequality remains such a focal point in the critical understanding of media as well as, as why it continues to persist in the supposedly enlightened 21st century. Now, many of us know that classical Hollywood reiterated core ideological tenets of the patriarchy, such as men and masculine values being privileged over women and female values, along with men as the active and powerful heroes of movies and TV shows, while women were relegated to the roles of love interests and uh, dam damsels waiting to be rescued. Now, as our screening for Monday misrepresentation demonstrates, the formal components of TV and film, including cinematography, editing, sound, and especially mise-en-scene or visual design, work together to construct images of how women and men were supposed to look, behave, and properly react in any given situation. Moreover, media consciously and unconsciously continue to simplify and essentialize the complexities of gender and identity. So, for example, we have to ask the question, what exactly is gender, isn't it, and is it the same thing as sex? Now, most, film and, most mainstream film and TV would say so, that they're the same, uh, but interchanging uh, gender and sex, along with considering male and female as stark binaries, reflects a sort of superficial understanding. The word sex describes the biological or chromosomal makeup of humans. Science tells us that people of the male sex are male because they're born with an XY chromosome, while people born of the female sex have XX chromosomes. Now, gender, on the other hand, is much more complicated. It can refer to one's internal sense of self as male, female, both, or neither, and this is what we call gender identity. Or it can refer to how one's outward presentations and behaviors rate, relate to the perception of sex, and this is what we call gender expression. Or it can also be a, the set of roles, activities, expectations, and behaviors assigned to individuals by society and the media, and this is what we call a gender role. Now, the important thing to remember is that gender is socially constructed because it is closely monitored, determined, and reinforced by society. While there may be a biological basis for some differences between individuals of different sexes, the social constructions of gender have an enormous impact on the ways we define ourselves as well as how society defines us. Now it's also important to note that gender moves beyond the traditional sexual binaries of male and female to include transgender, defined as an individual whose gender identity does not match their biological sex at birth, Cisgender, individuals whose gender identity conforms to their biological sex at birth. And gender fluidity, individuals who do not feel confined to a restricted gender identity or may feel that the conventional sexual binary does not accurately describe them. 
Now, it's important for us to remember that the division between sex and gender is a relatively new one in our society. For most of the 20th century, most people, including medical professionals, uh, didn't differentiate between sex and gender. Now, this interchanging wasn't a simple oversight, but an active byproduct of patriarchal thinking. This is because when people believe that gender is biologically determined rather than socially constructed, they are less likely to challenge the status quo, and therefore the patriarchy remains uncontested. So to give you an example, if a person is born with an XY chromosome, and they're instructed to believe that their gender is the same as their sex, that their anatomy forces them to embrace the color blue over the color pink, or prefer action figures to dolls, and jackets and ties to blouses and skirts. Now, if they believe that all of this is simple biological functioning and therefore normalized, their social instincts will probably accommodate belief and show less outward resistance against society's codes of strict male and female behavior. Another harm in believing only biology determines gender is considering that for all of human civilization, biology has been used as a system of classification while gender has historically been used as a system of hierarchy. In Western society, theologians insisted that God had created woman from the rib of man and that their purpose was literal more than a, as a reproductive object in possession of their intellectually and biologically superior mate. Now later, when evolutionary biology advocated a more scientifically robust view of human behavior, women were still presumed to be inferior as a result not of God, but by natural selection, which was the same belief system which advanced the notion that a black brain was biologically inferior to a white brain, uh, and etc. Freud argued that women had, uh, had envy from the moment that they realized that they didn't have a penis, thus the term penis envy. And today, the discriminatory policies of unequal wages and taxes are thrust upon a nation that is 51% female by an American Legislative Congress that is 81% male. So what role has the contemporary media played in perpetuating the patriarchal view of sex and gender being ideal, or excuse me, identical and static? As Mickey Mouse Monopoly showed us, the media play a crucial role in shaping our identities beginning at the earliest stages of social development, often before an infant can walk or talk. Cognitive psychologists argue that children are born more or less gender neutral, but as they grow, they process new information through cognitive filters, enabling them to interpret information about gender. Children's early gender identities depend on concrete physical cues like dress, hairstyle, and body size. Now, the media supplies children with these cues on a constant basis, and many cognitivists believe that by age three or four, the process of acquiring gender identity is actually irreversible. Increasingly, however, scholars believe that gender identity actually continues to develop through the entire life cycle, and that the more we grow, the more we become active agents in our own socialization, rather than simply passive receptors of social blueprints for appropriate gender behaviors. Now, this idea flies in the face of what media scholars call the hypodermic needle theory, the notion that every intended message communicated to us by media and society is received, absorbed, and goes unquestioned by a passive and impressionable viewer. And this is a theory that has you know, been long um, argued against, and if we were to buy into it that we're simply passive spectators, we probably wouldn't be taking this class. We probably wouldn't have film and media studies to begin with. Now, in the second half of the 20th century, film and media scholars began paying more and more attention to the ways in which entertainment media perpetuated myths and assumptions about gender, not just through identifiable, stereotype, uh, identifiable stereotypes such as the femme, femme fatale or the blonde bombshell, but in more indirect and subconscious ways. In 1976, feminist film scholar Laura Mulvey wrote an influential essay entitled Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema in which she merged a critical interpretation of the media's patriarchal and capitalist practices with elements of psychoanalysis. Now, Mulvey derived that films uh, get their power because of two things, two uh, psychoanalytic forces, one of which is narcissism, which is the pleasure of the self, and the other is voyeurism, pleasure of looking at others in a sexual way. 
Now, because cinema operated within a patriarchal society, the narcissistic pleasure of identification involved identifying internally with the male characters on screen, while the voyeuristic pleasure came from looking externally upon the female characters in a sexually objectified manner. Thus, Mulvey argued that the classical Hollywood cinema aims its films at a presumed male heterosexual audience, forcing individuals from outside this group to adapt to a straight male point of view, which Mulvey called the male gaze. And if they didn't do this, they would risk finding the film unpleasurable. Now, Mulvey extended the metaphor of the gaze to three distinct uh, different subjectivities of the cinematic form. The gaze of the camera, the gaze of the characters looking at each other, and the gaze of the spectator toward the screen, and found numerous examples demonstrating that within the classical mode of production, all three of these gazes were inherently male, even if the actual spectator was a woman. Put another way, when a male viewer gazed at a man on screen, he was supposed to identify with him. When a male viewer gazed at a woman on screen, he was supposed to be sexually turned on. And when a woman or gay man gazed at the screen, they were supposed to have the same reactions as the male viewer. Anything else, any oppositional or contradictory reading, went against the intended message of classical Hollywood. Now, Mulvey's ideas about the male gaze are important for several reasons, and uh, we can, you know, we anecdotally we can ex express why they might be important based on some of the media that we see. First, to remove sexual objectification and simply assume some kind of asexual objectivity ignores the realities and complexities of a visual medium where most of the images of women are constructed thematically as well as mechanically by men. The male gaze reiterates the desire of the patriarchy to essentialize women coded as sexual objects appealing to the desires of straight men. And if you don't believe this, just think about all the sex scenes you've seen in movies where uh, you've been able to see a woman's breasts and genitals, um, but the man's genitals remain crucially obscured from view. Finally, it's easy to label the image of a beautiful naked woman covered by, only by a leather jacket as a product of the male gaze. But it's more difficult to identify the inner workings of the male gaze and other more casual shots or points of view where the subject isn't always fetishized or even really a person. So this suggests that the male gaze doesn't necessarily exist in every shot you see. For Mulvey, the male gaze isn't so much something that you can readily identify um, in each shot of a movie, for example, but rather it's representative of, the, of how the broader formal design and, and visual components of media are consciously and subconsciously structured to support the continuation of patriarchal ideology namely the beliefs that men are strong and superior, that women are fragile and weak, and that sex and gender are the same thing. As we continue to screen media, working actively to resist the patriarchy, try to identify ways in which this resistance is framed through form, that is, cinematography, editing, sound, and visual design, rather than solely content-based. That is the lecture for today. I will see you later in the week.